Welcome to Light Church Online. Thank you for joining us for today's message. Well, we're talking about elements of the supernatural life. We know that these things should characterize the life that we live. As believers, we should be noted by these things. Now, these are not all the elements, but they are some of the predominant ones that should be constantly displayed in and through our lives. The first one we talked about was joy. Y'all don't, y'all got hooked on the mighty, you forgot the joy. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so uh, joy should characterize our lives. As Christians, we ought to be people of joy, not one of sadness and gloom and and discouraged and despaired. We are people of joy. That should be a part of everything that we do. All right, we come to church with joy. We pray with joy. Okay, we share Jesus with joy. Okay, we minister to others with joy. Okay, uh, that may be somewhat difficult sometimes when you look at us. Because, honestly, it took me a while, Brother Jamal, to figure out that uh, what I saw some church members do when they said they were rejoicing, I thought they was in pain. They just the way they looked to me. And, you know, some people that dance, you look at them dance, and you think they hurting. Right? You seen the expressions on their face? You know, it's like, well, I don't want that, that's for sure. All right, but, but we should be people of joy. And then we know we should be people of, of peace. The peace that Jesus said he left us was his. And so there should, never be a, there should never be a time when we are anxious or worried or fearful or insecure. We are people of peace. So that no matter what our environment is, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, when people look at us, they have somewhat of a calm because they know that we believe the God that we serve. When Peter, excuse me, when uh, Paul was on the ship headed to Rome, they got caught in a fierce storm that took them almost, in fact, more than two weeks to deal with. The sun and the moon couldn't be seen. It was, it was what we call pitch black. And that storm was fierce. And the men on that ship, professional though they were, gave up all hope that they would be saved. But Paul said, in the midst of that, brethren, be cool. I got a word from God. See, that's, that's peace in the midst of the storm. All right, when your family is going through something, somebody that's a believer ought to be able to stand up and say, hey, we're not going to fall apart here because I got a word from God. And that word gives us peace. It goes beyond our ability to understand it. Uh, people can't understand why you so calm at such a confused time. But that's because we are people of peace. I said we are people of peace. Amen. Amen. All right. And then we found out last week that we are people of, of hope. All right. A lot of what ails this generation when I say this generation I'm more uh, uh, I'm talking more about the times in which we live and the people that live in these times one of the things that seems to uh, trouble them most is a hopelessness that things will get better and so depending on how long you have dealt with a situation it can wear on you and if you, if you don't know where your hope is, you will give up. And like 
the enemy would love for you to do, you will try and take shortcuts to what you know or what you believe God wants you to have. I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, you know, well, well, God don't want me to starve. And so that's why I can't pay my tithes. And I mean, I know that that's really not funny. It just means that the situation that they're in, in their minds, is hopeless. And the only way out is to take a shortcut. So we're going to take God's money. And we're going we're gonna to pay our bills or we're going to do thus and so with it. So often when, when hopelessness sets in, people take shortcuts. Because they don't think there's any other way for them to come up out of the mess that they're in. But as Christians, we are people of hope. And if there is no other reason for us to be hopeful, even in the midst of what seems like a hopeless situation, it's just remembering the story of the resurrection. I mean... Can you have a better reason to have hope? Here's a man that died, spent three days in hell. Everybody wrote him off. Satan believed and pumped his chest thinking that he had annihilated the Prince of Peace. And even the disciples that he had trained Though many times he told them what would happen. They themselves gave up hope. So much so that even after he was raised and the women that went to the grave and discovered Jesus wasn't there. They go back. In fact, Jesus sent them back to tell his disciples to meet him in Jerusalem. They didn't even believe her because they had given up hope. And it wasn't until Jesus himself appeared to them that they finally realized he's up. Amen. So as a Christian, man, we got the best reason to hope even in the midst of what seems like hopelessness. And that's because though you may have tried to count Jesus out. Don't you ever put a period where Jesus says put a comma. Uh, you under, he tried to tell him, don't put a period right here at the, at the grave. Don't, don't put one there at the tomb. Put a comma there because because you're going to weep for a little while, but then your weeping's going to be turned into joy. So as a believer, I don't care what it may look like, I still have hope. Amen. I have hope. Now, I got to tell you, this might not meet with, uh, with your fancy because we can be so worldly that we only think in terms of right here and right now. But when you read the book of Hebrews, you find out that there were those that it gives us that though they did not see the end of their faith on this side, it said they, they had a better resurrection. Amen. So, so if I don't see everything on this side, I still have hope because I know that I'll see it on the other side. Amen. I might not get the house that I want on this side, but on the other side, Jesus said, in my father's house. Oh, y'all don't get me started this morning. Amen. Amen. So I got a reason to always have hope. Yeah. All right, maybe you think you messed up too much. And so there's no way for you to get back. But I heard 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, that means those that messed up and know they messed up and those that messed up and think they didn't mess up. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So, so the only way I think that you can mess up beyond you being able to get up is that you die before you repent. That's the only way I can think of. All right, and according to the scripture, Jesus said, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost will put you in that condition, which, if you got to ask what it is, is a good indication you don't qualify. Amen. So you got hope, church, you got hope. Don't ever let any situation push you to the point where you lose the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. It just don't get that bad. All right? Things that we deal with in this world are subject to change. Are you listening to me? So, you, so as long as it's not permanent, why would you give up hope? Glory to God. Well, finally, for this uh, series of messages, I want to talk about another element of the supernatural life found again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. And it reads, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and what else? And love. And the greatest of these is love. All right, so we're talking about what characterizes the supernatural life as a believer, as a, as a child of God, we know, that, we know that hope characterizes that life. We know that peace characterizes that life. We know that joy characterizes that, <laughs> that life. All right, so love, he says, is the greatest of all those things that will last forever love. So I want to look at a few things that Jesus said about it. I realize that love is such an inexhaustible subject that there's no way that we could exhaust it in just the short time that we have. And I know some of you think I often try to exhaust it, but nevertheless, uh, we won't try to exhaust it today. All right, as my pastor used to say, if you pray, I'll preach. All right. All right, all right. So love is the greatest of all of these. When we go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So love is the, is the nature of God. Now, often when we hear that word, we jump automatically, mentally, to a feeling. And so we equate this feeling that we have with what the Bible calls love, and that's incorrect. So when we look at what Jesus says, see, love, according to the book of Galatians, is a product of the recreated spirit. See, there's a list there in Galatians chapter 5, says, but the fruit of the spirit is, and in that list is love. So it's a product of the recreated spirit. So a person that is, is genuinely born again, has been recreated after Christ, has to have that love as part of their makeup. Now, 
as it is in many cases, a lot of what we have in us as new, cre new creatures, we don't realize for several reasons. One is because we're ignorant of it. And so if you're coming on Wednesday nights in our disciple youth sessions, you're being educated as to what you have as a new creation. And so one reason we don't realize it is because we're ignorant of it. And the other reason that I think we don't realize it is because we don't exercise it. We still think it's something God's got to do. And so uh, I used to hear saints pray, Lord, give us that love that runs from heart to heart and from breast to breast as though God still has to impart this love to us. But the newly created spirit already has the love of God in him because that's the nature of God himself. So if you got a love problem, you probably just need to get born again. And then learn how to exercise that love so that the fruit of it is seen in your life. And stop waiting on some kind of feeling to hit you. And then when you feel good about somebody, then you treat them that way. All right? So we know that God is love. Say it. God is love. All right. Now, if God is love, then certainly he has love. Right? But he has love because... He is love. All right? Well, that means then that everything that God does has to have love in it. And that's hard for a lot of people to take because we have been worldly minded when it comes to this subject. See, we think that it's not love if it hurts. It's not love if it's uncomfortable. It's not love if it, doesn't, if it doesn't satisfy our whims and our desires. But John 3, 16, have you heard that one? Yeah. It says God, so that he, yeah. what? Yeah. All right, now think about what his only begotten son did. Yeah. Right? Was he beaten? Yeah. You think that felt good? But yet we know, even in his being beaten, that had love in it. Did they put a crown of thorns on his head? Thought that feel good? No. But the pain of that brow being pierced had love in it. They stuck a sword in his side. Blood and water came out. You, you think that felt good? They put nails in his hands and in his feet. How about that? So see, in our thinking, that can't be love because it's painful. And that's the reason a lot of times we don't operate in the love of God. Because it doesn't feel good all the time. Some things that God require you to do because of love doesn't always feel good. Maybe I ought to say that again because y'all got real quiet right there. Some things that God requires us to do out of love doesn't always feel good. They're not always convenient. It's not always comfortable. Okay? But because we are, we are born of God, that love is in us, and we have to place demands on it if we're going to live supernaturally. All right? So in John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. New commandment. New commandment. What does that tell you? A new commandment. 
that there was an old one, but now they are required to do the new one. Now listen to this. Love each other. Does that sound new? No, because even in the Old Testament, that's what God instructed them to do. So Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment. So the new one says, love each other just as I have loved you, you should love each other. So the new part comes when he says, the way I have loved you. And Jesus modeled love perfectly through his obedience to the Father. So the love each other part was not new. But when he says, like I have loved you, now there's another spin put on it. Are you listening to me? All right, so it's not just, well, I love you. Well, wait a minute. Let's find out what Jesus did so that we can love like he loved because that's the new commandment, all right? So when he tells them that your loving one another like I have loved you is a new commandment, he follows it up with verse 35. Your love for one another. For who? For who? Your love for... All right, now let's, 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 let's find out who this one another is. Because a lot of people think that one another means everybody. But who was he talking to? He was talking to who? He was talking to his disciples. Right? So who do you suppose he meant when he said one another? Huh? Okay, he has to be talking to those disciples. And so when he says one another, he has to be talking about those disciples. When he says you love one another, he has to mean Peter, you got to love James. James, you got to love Peter. He's got to say, he's got to be saying, uh, Matthew, you got to love Judas. She said one another. He's not talking about everybody, not at this point. Then he says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Wow, I wish I had more time to spend there. But think about it. Think about all that we have done as a church to try and convince the world that they ought to come and be a part of the Christian family. And yet, with all that we have done, all of the money that we spend, all of the resources that we try and employ to, as we say, win the world, the, the, the population of the world isn't getting smaller. And yet, statistics say that the church of the Lord Jesus is not growing exponentially as fast as the world's population. So that means something is wrong. Somewhere we're missing it because, because when we read what happened in Acts chapters 2 through 5, we see the church growing at an alarming rate. And we are told that those who watched the church had great respect for them. It said the people esteemed them highly. So why then does the church, namely you and me, why do we have such a tough time with the world esteeming us? Well, Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world you are my disciples. So it just sounds to me like if we got this part right, 
that we would do a lot better with winning the loss. It's kind of hard to convince people that you serve a loving God and that Jesus loved them. It's kind of hard to convince people of that when you're always beating them over the head with their sins. When did Jesus do that? All right. When you think about the one another that he is addressing. Loving one another, that's how you're going to prove to those outside that you are my disciples. Okay, so what goes on inside is going to influence those outside. Well, we think that you have to go outside to influence them to come inside. Jesus says it's what's going on inside that will prove to those outside that you are my disciples. So let's, let's look at some of what's going on inside. Inside. Now, I'm talking about the church as we know it. We, we look at racial strife going on. Oh, y'all getting quiet now, huh? Going on inside. All right, black and white and Hispanic and Asian, and we're all divided up inside. All right, and, and even to this day, 2020, we still have believers, and I'm really talking about leaders now, that say they will not marry two people who are not of the same ethnic group. That's inside. We still got divorces inside. We still have parents who are not parenting inside. We still have lying going on among the people inside. So Apparently, we got a love problem that we won't, we won't deal with. We still got people offended and allowing the offense to fester and to seethe for years inside. We still got people sitting on one side of the auditorium that won't speak to people on the other side of the auditorium. Inside. See, how can we expect the world to think that we've been with Jesus when we won't even model what Jesus did. When did Jesus ever put down sinners? The, even the Pharisees and the, the leaders of the Jews that were supposed to know the law and be familiar with what God wanted. Had no clue about who God really was. And so there was a division on several different levels. Kids were not allowed to approach the leaders of the church. 
So when Jesus was teaching those guys who were arguing among themselves about preferred positions. I want to be the assistant pastor. I want to be the assistant to the assistant. One on the right, one on the left. And, and, and it's so important to us that we're going to get mama to go ask Jesus. <clears throat> so Jesus, in addressing that and having to deal with that, calls a little child over to sit with those men, which they did not like. And he says to them, let me show you what the kingdom is like. Now, in, in, in Jesus' setting, all of them were Jews. And they were still fighting among themselves. So, I don't care if you got an all-white congregation, an all-black congregation, all-Hispanic congregation, there's still strife. And that strife is making us look like we don't belong to Jesus. See, if you're going to live this life, you are called to respond differently to situations after you get saved than you did before you got saved. Okay, people, people make you mad before you got saved. You just cuss them out, shoot them, whatever. But since you get sa you gotten saved, Jesus says, now when people persecute you, when people curse you, this is how you should respond. How, Jesus? I want you to bless those that curse you. Say what? Bless them. And I want you to pray for those that abuse you. Say that again. I want you to pray for them. And, you, and by the way, you do know he's not saying pray that God will get them. Your response is different. Why? Because your nature is different. The nature of God is love. And so if you've been born again after him, you have to have his nature. And that means that that nature responds differently to situations that come up as opposed to the old nature that you used to have. And that nature is one of love. So, let's look at a few things Jesus said. He said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> Say what? If you love me, keep my commandments. All right? Now, nowhere in Jesus' statements about love, and he mentions it all through those five chapters I told you that he just, I mean, he was talking because of the urgency of the hour, and he knew that his time with those men were, was coming to a close. And so for five chapters, Jesus mentioned about peace in a couple of them. He mentioned about joy in a couple of them. But in every one of those five chapters, he talks about love. All right? So he never talks about love from the context of feelings. He never talks about love relative to emotions. He always equated love with obedience. So he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So all of this talk that we do about loving God can be easily proven or disproven. 
by the standard that Jesus lays out if you keep his commandments. Because that's how he measures whether or not you love him. Jesus says that the Father God loves us because we love Jesus. John 16, 27. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Well, do you love Jesus? Well, how do we know? Jesus just told us in John chapter 14, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. So that's how we prove we love Jesus. Then he says, now if you love me, my father's going to love you. You see the connection? And nowhere in there is emotions ever brought up. Jesus said God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. In John chapter 17, verse 23, I in them, you are in me. Or I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. To wrap your head around this truth is one of the greatest revelations that you can get. And I must tell you, it's going to be an ongoing revelation because in our human intellect, there's no way you can believe that God loves you as much as he loves Jesus if you know who Jesus is, if you know the kind of person Jesus is. If you know that Jesus perfectly pleased the Father. That everything the Father told Jesus to do, he did. Everything the Father taught Jesus to say, he said it. And he said it the way the Father told him to say it. So when you look at Jesus, you think of a person who has never sinned. You think of a person who never stepped out of line. You think of a person who never disobeyed his Father. But when you think of you... You know all of your flaws, all of your mistakes. You know that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So to think that God would love you, a sinner, as much as he loves Jesus, the sinless one, is difficult to grasp mentally. So you can't get it mentally. You have to receive it spiritually and meditate on it to the, to the point where you realize that if God loves you as much as he loves Jesus, then he'll do for you what he will do for Jesus. And you have confidence when you go before him. So like Jesus who said to the Father, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. Well, that's what happens when you have confidence in God's love for you like you have confidence in God's love for Jesus. There's not a one of you in here who would dare to believe that God would not do everything Jesus asked him. Would you? No, you know that whatever Jesus prayed, God would back it up. In fact, one sister made that same statement. Her brother had died. Jesus delayed his coming. When he finally got there, she says to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. He had been in the grave for several days. And then she says, but I know you can ask him even now. I know he's been dead for a little while, but if you ask him, I know he'll answer you. And that's the way we all feel, isn't it? Don't you feel like whatever Jesus asks, God will do it. Oh, if I could get Jesus to ask for me, I know I get it. Well, guess what? He has asked the Father. You know what he asked the Father? Father, when you hear them pray in my name, give them what they want. So he has done that. Jesus has set us up to be loved by his father the same way as he is loved by his father. 
But you can't get that mentally because mentally you cannot grasp due to condemnation and guilt that always seeks to remind you of how short you come. You just finished lying. How you gonna go up there in the church? You go up there in the church with that alcohol on your breath. You know what you did? How you gonna go up there and ask? I, I saw you at the altar. What you doing up there? That's condemnation. All right? But Jesus fixed it. He fixed it so that there is therefore now that I'm in Christ, now that I've been born again, now that I have come out of darkness and into the marvelous light, now that I have a new nature, I have gone from hatred and enmity against God to the love of God himself being shed abroad in my heart by his spirit. I have now come to that point and so I can go before him trusting in the love that he has for Jesus and for me. So when I ask, I don't have to doubt whether or not he hears me. Because he told me if you ask, according to my will, I'll hear you. And if I hear you, whatever you ask, it's a done deal. So Jesus said, he loves you just like he loves me. And to prove it, to back that up, Jesus said, now so far, I've been doing all the prayer. You haven't asked anything. But now I'm getting ready to go. You go ask the Father. And I'm giving you my name. So, so if you ask him in my name. If you ask him in my name. Whatever it is. He'll give it to you. By that, he is going to prove to you that he loves you just like he loves me. Jesus said about those, those disciples in the prayer that he prayed at the end of this discourse, John chapter 17. He says, Father, now keep in mind, he's talking about some ruffians. All right, James and John was called the sons of thunder. That's another way of saying them brothers was quick triggered. You know what I mean? They, hey, they throw down in a minute's notice. You know, say what? You don't like our Jesus. But we, you know, we ain't got the witness to you no more. We can take care of this. We can take care of this in another way. And Jesus had to calm them fellas down. Say, say wait a minute now, y'all, you know, well, who y'all think y'all are? You know, this, this ain't the way I handle business. Beat up folk that don't want to get saved. So that's who he's talking about. He's talking about Peter. Peter, the one that's got a revelation about who Jesus is. All right. And yet he's walking around with a switchblade. You know what I mean? I mean, Jesus done, done dealt with demons. You know, remember that guy called Legion? Had all them demons in him. The chains wouldn't hold that brother. And he's going to try and protect this Jesus with a knife. These are the fellows that Jesus is praying about. And he says to the Father, Father, I want you to know how much they love me. And I want the world to know how much you love them. Amen. Amen. Let me translate it for you. Father, I know they got some problems. But you gave them to me. And I have kept them in your name. Now, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Just keep them while they're here. That's what Jesus prayed. Now, this is after he told them, I've been doing all the praying. But when I leave, 
you don't have to ask me anything. You go directly to the Father. And just like he heard me, he'll hear you. Just like he granted me what I asked him, he'll grant you what you ask him in my name. Oh, wonderful Jesus. And it's all centered around love. It's all centered around love. So when we look at what Jesus instructed us to do, he says it's not just good enough for you to love one another. I want you to love one another like I love you. And he demonstrated it on a number of occasions. You remember the foot washing episode? I mean, Jesus is getting ready. Again, he's just hours before the arrest. They're getting ready to have the Passover. Jesus takes off his robe like a slave would do. Takes a pail of water. Kneels down and starts to wash the crud off of their feet. And their feet would have been cruddy. Why? Because they didn't have shoes like you and I have. And the streets were not asphalt or cement. They were dirt. You know what happens on a dirty street when horses and oxen go down them? You've been to parades. You know them horses don't care nothing about your kids standing there on the, on, the horse don't care about your little darling standing there watching him when he got to go he is going number one and number two so when Jesus kneels down to wash these men's feet look at what he has to deal with if I had if I had time I, I preach about Jesus dealing with our mess but I'm not, I'm not going to go there today but, but just rest assured just like he washed the mess off of their feet he's been washing the mess off of us just as well that's how he say you ought to be loving one another because at the end of that he said now just like you saw me wash your feet you ought to wash one another's feet. That's how he equated love. So, as part of who we are, yes, we ought to be people of joy. We ought to be people of peace. We ought to be people filled with hope. And most of all, we ought to demonstrate that we are truly his disciples by how we love one another. And the church has done a poor job of demonstrating that through the years. If the church had demonstrated that, there would not have been a need for a civil rights movement. If the church had been demonstrating that the way Jesus taught, there would not have been a need for a woman's suffrage movement. If the church had been demonstrating this kind of love, there would not have been a need for all kinds of factions and groups to develop specific causes that seem to, insinu uh, to, that seem to uh, insinuate that we are better or less than the world. And every cause that is established from any group of people springs out of a failure of the church to love one another like Jesus said we should. The first church in the book of Acts had racial strife that surfaced because 
when they were distributing goods to those that needed it. The Greeks and the Hebrews began to be contentious because the Greeks felt like they were being discriminated against. But the church quickly addressed it and put that down. So that after they resolved their issues, the Bible says that so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now you mean to tell me that the word of God grew in that context because the church addressed racial strife in such a way that it showed love for one another. I don't care nothing about you being Hebrew. You my brother. I don't care about you being Greek. You my brother. Well, why don't we see that today? I don't care about you being black, you being white. I don't care about you being Asian or Hispanic. Wherever you come from, if you have been born again, you are the one another that Jesus says, I got to love like he loves me. And when the church gets this right, and it will, that's why I say you got to be a person of hope if you're a Christian. Because for years, man, I looked at this racial situation and I, I asked God, Lord, what are you going to do? I just, in my thinking, I cannot see how this is ever going to work because it is so entrenched. A lot of it has been taught from the pulpit as though it were part of the word of God that God wanted separate but equal. When clearly he says... In Christ, neither Jew nor Greek means anything but a new creature. So I could care less what ethnicity my daughter or my son brings home and says, this is who I intend to marry. There ain't but one question. Well, actually it's two. There's just one question that's primary. And that is, are they born again? Do they know Jesus? That's, that's the first question. All right, now the rest of it, I mean, I'll just leave that, you know. But I've got one more question. And, you know, that, that question is, do they look good? But anyway, you know, that's just, that's just my question. That ain't, that ain't, in, that ain't in Scripture, but that's, that's, that's just, I didn't receive that of the Lord, but... I just, you know, I just got that, you know, amen. If the church had gotten this right, think of how much further along our country, our world would be. In the church that we read about in Acts, there was no classism. Because those that were rich took some of their stuff and sold it to meet the needs of those that didn't have anything. So that the Bible says, in this one another, nobody suffered lack. And the Bible says, and the word of God grew. That's what happens when we do what Jesus said. Love one another like he has loved us. Final thing I'm going to say. And this is by no means an indictment over churches who support outside charitable organizations. I will simply say, you have to get it in the right order. I can't give money that's given to the kingdom to organizations that are outside the kingdom before I support what's inside the kingdom. Can't do that. I'm not saying I don't give at all. I'm just saying, first priority, Jesus says, is love one another. All right? So, so that might sound a little harsh to somebody looking on, but let me tell you, I'm just following what Jesus said. All right? I'm not finna give somebody on the street five dollars because they got to sign up and then my sister or my brother in the same family 
in the same household even needs food and I won't give them anything? No, it's got to be reversed. See, he said, do good to everybody. Galatians chapter 6, I believe it is. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. Church, if you want to see a difference made, let's start practicing loving one another. Like Jesus. Like Jesus. Like Jesus loved us. Go ahead and stand. Life is a race, but you don't have to run it alone. Take advantage of your help. Receive Jesus today, and he will help you with everything you're going through. God has a plan for you. The first step in that plan is salvation. Read Romans 10 and 9 and pray this prayer of salvation. God in heaven, I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I call on you now for my eternal salvation. I receive forgiveness for all my sin. I accept your unconditional love. Thank you for receiving me. I submit myself to you. With you as my helper, I will live according to your plan the rest of my life. Amen. If you are blessed by today's message, we encourage you to give an offering. Simply click the Give Online link on the Light Church homepage. Thank you for tuning in this week. We look forward to you joining us during our next broadcast. Have a blessed week.